Hello everyone, my name is Togrul Maharamov. Today I'm going to be talking about roll-ups through the prism of validating bridges, or in other words, how roll-ups actually actually work. Um, so to start, uh, let's discuss what roll-ups actually are. So roll-ups, and, and just to note the data availability mode of the protocol, that's it, everything else is an implementational detail. So this illustration shows how it works. So a chain B posts the data to chain A, and this data should be enough to reconstruct the state of uh, chain B. And that, uh, that chain can be classifi classified as a rollup. Uh, so what is data availability? Data availability is uh, a mode uh, that defines uh, for some predefined amount of time, let's say T, the protocol data is made available to all the nodes that are willing to download it. And uh, so sh you shouldn't confuse it with protocol uh, data storage because data storage is a problem of making data infinitely available. So rollups inherit data availability guarantees of the underlying layer. That's what rollups are. And by as a side effect, rollups also inherit ordering guarantees of the underlying layer because of uh, the data being posted. And I'll explain what ordering is. So ordering is a phenomenon that defines a sequence X once it's finalized. And that sequence can no longer be changed or updated later once the finality is reached. So as you can see in this figure here, uh, there, uh, there's a block in tip that is comprised of a sequence of transactions. And because it's a tip, it's not finalized yet. It depends on a protocol, but let's assume that in this particular protocol, the tip is not finalized. Uh, and at some point, there's a fork that completely reorgs the contents of that block. So it still contains the same transactions, but they are reversed in their order or whatever. Uh, at that point, there's no way of telling which fork is going to be the winning one, which fork is going to be included in the canonical chain. But once the chain A and the block in the chain A that contains a sequence, so in this case, it's the, uh, latter, it's the former sequence, is finalized, you can consider the block to be, uh, the, the contents to be finalized, so the order can no longer be changed. And Basically, that allows us to have data available, uh, ordering for free just by posting data on the underlying layer. So now uh, to roll-up types. There are two roll-up types that are necessary to be known. Uh, sovereign roll-ups and classic roll-ups. Note that when I refer to classic roll-ups, that's what you know as roll-ups. It's your conventional roll-ups deployed on top of Ethereum, etc. Uh, so. The difference between a sovereign and a classic rollup is that uh, the goal of a sovereign rollup is to inherit some security from the underlying layer. So let's say Ethereum or Celeste or something like that, you want to bootstrap the security from them instead of deploying the chain from scratch, and you deploy a sovereign rollup. And then classic rollups scale and introduce new features to the underlying layer through a trust minimized bridge. Sovereign rollups permit the participants of the protocol to define the fork choice rule. What I mean by fork choice rule is this. So as you can see in this case, there are three different forks that the users can choose. And while in a classic rollup, the fork choice rule is defined by the, by the underlying layer, so a rollup, the chain that, to which the rollup posts the data chooses the fork for the users, in case of a sort of roll-up, it's actually done by the users or by the protocol, by the consensus. Uh, and that's why we call them sovereign roll-ups, because uh, the users decide which fork to follow. So in other words, the canonical chain is defined by the protocol participants. Meanwhile, the ordering within the canonical chain is defined by the underlying layer. So you can think of it this way. If a certain order has been finalized, the users are free to choose any transactions within that order and define them as the part, part of the canonical chain. So with that out of the way, let's look into classic rollups. Classic rollups 
on top of inheriting data availability. And ordering guarantees also inherit censorship resistance and validity guarantees from the underlying layer. Note that validity guarantees are inherited based on certain assumptions that are made by the state transition enforcement mechanism used by the rollups. I'll go into that later. That's a lot of big words. Uh, so censorship resistance is defined as some time U within which a user originated transaction is guaranteed to be inserted in the canonical chain. Note that the actual definition is a bit more complex, but I don't want to go into the details here because I'll just bore you for hours. And validity is execution, um, is enforcement of execution that is compliant with the state transition function of the protocol. So what I mean by it is uh, every protocol, so let's say Ethereum has certain rules that the, that the that the protocol has to follow, and validity enforces that those rules are followed. This is an example of a state transition function. Uh, I know it doesn't really make any sense, it's just a bunch of weird looking symbols, but if you look at it in this way, it's actually a state transition function of Ethereum from Ethereum's yellow paper. So uh, sigma prime is the new state, uh, the weird looking Y that is called epsilon is the state transition function, sigma uh, is the previous state, and the transaction is t. So what it means is that the state transition function, y, epsilon, takes the previous state and the transaction and outputs the new state that is produced after the execution of the transaction. So essentially you can define uh, a state transition function as a set of rules that the execution needs to comply with in order to successfully mutate the state of the system. And by mutate, I mean modify the state of the system, whatever that is. So for, uh, for mm, Bitcoin, it's the set of unspent transaction outputs. For Ethereum, it's the state of all the accounts in the system that are non-empty, etc. And back to validity. Validity guarantees are either enforced through fraud proofs or zero knowledge proofs. There are two enforcement mechanisms for that. Uh, optimistically, uh, fraud proofs optimistically enforce the validity of rollup by allocating a predefined time V for the onlookers to challenge the committed state. What I mean by it is, let me show you in a graph. So if you look at the figure here, there's an executor. It's the entity in uh, optimistic rollups that commits the state to the validating bridge and I'll go into what validating bridge is later. And there's another entity, and that entity is permissionless. It can be anyone in the system. So they follow the committed state and then fetch the state from the bridge and compare it to the state that they locally computed. So let, uh, let's say if the states are not equivalent for, for some reason, they can initiate a challenge. And once the challenge is initiated, that they basically go back and forth between the challenger and the executor until one of them is proven to be correct, or the, the original state commitment or the claim by the challenger. And, uh, and there is another model that is called, what I described now is called an interactive multi-round proof, but there's also a fraud proof mechanism called non-interactive single round in which the challenger just submits the witness for the correct state and then the contract just verifies it without arbitrating the uh, back and forth between the two entities. And now zero knowledge proofs. Zero knowledge proofs enforce validity of the rollup by proving the correctness of the computation via cryptographic system. So in case of a zero knowledge proof, the rollup looks a bit different. So the sequencer posts the data as well as the state to the validating bridge and then the prover just commits the validity proof that proves that the state was computed correctly. There's no other interaction needed whatsoever. So there are two uh, types of classic rollups, optimistic and pessimistic. No, I'm joking. Uh, optimistic and zero knowledge. Note that some people refer to zero knowledge rollups as validity rollups. I'm looking at Starkware people. Uh, so the difference Optimistic rollups utilize fraud proofs to enforce validity, 
and zero knowledge rollups utilize zero knowledge proofs to enforce a validity, as the name might suggest. So, classic rollups, th that's what makes classic rollups un unique, is they get their trust minimized compatibility with the underlying layer for free as a side effect of validity guarantees. So, what I mean by trust minimized compatibility is compatibility. So, uh, compatibility is basically when you can connect between two systems. And trust minimized compatibility is when you, is when that communication between two distinct systems is trust minimized. And by trust minimized, I mean a system in which the assumptions required to securely communicate is one out of n, where n is unbounded or weaker. And luckily, both fraud proofs and zero knowledge proofs comply with the definition of trust minimized. So both of them allow you to have trust minimized bridging. So finally, after what, 11 minutes, I uh, come to the topic in the title, validating bridges. After validating bridges uh, inherits the security guarantees that are, uh, sorry, uh, the security guarantees are enforced by validating bridges. That's, just to remind, the four security guarantees of a classic rollup is data availability, ordering, uh, validity and censorship resistance. And validating bridges enforce validity either, either through the use of fraud proofs or zero knowledge proofs, are, as I previously explained. And this is an example of how the validity proof or validating bridge works. So you see a rollup and it posts data and at some point a zero knowledge proof or a fraud proof if the data is incorrect to the validating bridge. And then the chain is, uh, the chain that it posted to guarantees certain security properties that I described before. And as you can see here, if you remove the validating bridge, there's no longer those guarantees. So the guarantees are inherited through the validating bridge. If you remove it, you just get a sovereign roll up. So, and from this, we can deduce that the validating bridge is defined, is what defines a classic rollup. Note that it is possible to have a validating contract that doesn't actually bridge, but there's no much use case for it, and also it doesn't really matter from the purpose of the premise. In that case, the classic rollup would be defined through the validating contract, or whatever you want to call it. And finally, how bridging works in classic rollups. So this is what you expect from a classic bridge, just a normal bridge. A user, let's call the user Alice, the, uh, sends a request to the chain to deposit five ETH to a rollup. The chain records that request, and then somebody picks up that request. It depends on a bridge design. There are multiple ways you can pick up that request and put it to the rollup side bridge. And the rollup bridge just sends the five ETH to Alice's account on that side. And the same is in reverse. So uh, Alice requests the bridge on the rollup side to withdraw five ETH back to the native chain. It just somebody through some arbitrary mechanism, you pick up that request, relay it to the other chain, the other chain unlocks the funds and send it to Alice. But it's not how rollups work. In rollups, you have this additional mechanism, which is very important. So uh, originally, it goes the same way. So Alice requests a deposit. You mint five ETH by relaying it to the bridge, uh, to the bridge of the rollup, whatever, whatever. But at that point, the, the transfer actually didn't happen. The transfer happens once the uh, correctness of that transfer is proved to the native chain. And once that's done, then you have a transfer happening, which means that unless the proof mechanism that the rollup uses is broken, it's impossible for somebody to mint uh, the tokens that Alice didn't originally request. And the same goes the other way around. So Alice requests the withdrawal, the withdrawal is relayed to the validating bridge on, on the chain. 
and for the withdrawal to actually be pr processed, you need to prove that the balance had sufficient funds and all the state transitions up to that point were correct. And so uh, just a, a short conclusion. So rollups can either be sovereign or have trust minimized compatibility with the underlying base layer. They can't have both. It, those two are basically mutually exclusive. And finally, if a rollup has trust minimized compatibility with the underlying layer, then by definition, the rollup is defined through the validating bridge. So if you remove the validating bridge, you, don't, you no longer have a composable rollup. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask.